Okay, so uh, we're reading from the uh, book here, a survey of the Old Testament, the Bible Jesus used. And uh, we are doing this uh, survey of the Old Testament to uh, give people a taste of what the Old Testament is about and, you know, all of the doctrines that come from the Old Testament and why it's relevant. Why is the Old Testament relevant? And one of the things we want to um, communicate to you is that the Old Testament is very relevant because it is the Bible that Jesus actually read. So when we, when we go into the Old Testament, we, we really need to realize that this is the only Bible, the Old Testament is, it is the only Bible that Jesus read. There wasn't any Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or Acts of the Apostles, or any, any of that. None of that was around at the time when Jesus was on the earth. So the Old Testament is the book that Jesus read. So that's one of the reasons why we're doing this. It's important that you know why we're doing it. Now, uh, the, the question for the night, who has read the entire Old Testament? Have you ever read the entire Old Testament? And can you explain the topics of the books? You know, there's a lot of different topics in different books. So anyway, tonight what I'm going to do is just talk about uh, from this book here, why study the Old Testament? And again, this is a survey of the Old Testament, this course that I took in Bible college. And uh, when I was getting my master's degree in biblical studies, and I also have a doctorate's degree in ministry. So when I was getting my master's degree in biblical studies, this was the book that we used. Now, um, in the book here, it talks about, in the introduction, why study the Old Testament. Here's why. Number one, it is the Bible that Jesus read. It's the only one that the disciples had access to. And then um, another thing is that there are foundational doctrines that we discover as we began our journey of coming to know who God is. So you gotta realize that God is developing in our mind. We're coming to discover the nature of God and the, and the nature of God, we come to discover him through the, the Old Testament. Starting with the Old Testament, we, we'd come to discover the nature of God. So let's go to Genesis, Exodus, Num Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. In these books, these are the first five books of the Bible, we discover that God is a creator, that he's an emancipator, and that he sets laws up. He's legal, and then he's moral. We find all of the moral laws, uh, you know, contained in the first five books of the Bible. We also f find also the nature of what God is. God is a creator. And uh, we also see him as an emancipator. So he uses different names. God uses different names to explain to the children of Israel who he is as he develops a relationship with him with them. And uh, the children of Israel were the chosen people of God. And so in that choosing them, he had to reveal himself to humanity. And this is one of the reasons why we need to study the Old Testament, because in the Old Testament, 
we discover the doctrines uh, of, of God. Basically, uh, here are some of the foundation of doctrine. Doctrines such as sin and salvation, man and his mandates, the kingdom of Christ, and the foundation or teachings of the Old Testament. So everything we see in the New Testament has a parallel to the Old Testament, right? Here's an interesting thing. You know, we, we develop the understanding that God is both a lion and he is both a lamb, that Jesus Christ is both the lion and the lamb. Uh, that was first discovered, you know, or first uh, uh, given to us, that revelation was given to us in the, of course, the, the Psalms, when we read about, you know, the Lord being our shepherd and, and then also, you know, we, we discover the figures of lions when David slays a lion, but then also we, we, we discover the nature of these animals and the importance that they have in scripture. We also encounter, um, th these are what we call motifs. So a motif is, is, a, um, is a symbol that continues to grow in scripture. You have the wolf also found in the uh, book of Isaiah. And so again, you have the wolf as, one, as part of the motif of the predator of the, of the lamb. But then you also have the lamb, which is a representation of a payment for sin and the sacrificing of lambs and animals like that. So uh, in the Old Testament, we're going to run into a lot of that, right? But again, this is a developing narrative that develops over time. So you, you're going to have God developing who he is. Because obviously, if you don't, if you don't know a person, you got to get to know them. And one of the ways we get to know God is through the Old Testament. Surprisingly, most people think they come into relationship with God through the New Testament. But the New Testament is simply representing issues that were originally in the uh, Old Testament. Um, here are some of the other things that we discover uh, about the Old Testament is that uh, the Old Testament is a key that unlocks the meaning that we find in many of the Revelation passages. So if you are trying to interpret Revelation, you will not be able to interpret Revelation without looking at the Old Testament. And one of the key books of the Old Testament would be Daniel. And so the book of Daniel gives us a lot of insight on the book of Revelation. <clears throat> you know, so as we study this, study these books, uh, I want you to remember and recall that, okay, when you see the New Testament, if when we get into the New Testament, when you see the things in the New Testament, just realize that they were, that the Old Testament is the first time you heard about it. These are foundational things that we discover. Um, here's another thing. We discover that God has not changed and he doesn't change. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever, found in the book of Hebrews 13, 8, but also found in Revelation, when in the book of Revelation, he says, write those things which were, which are, and which are to come, because God is always in the present. And so we, we discover that God changes not because he's timeless. Right. He, he's timeless. People have not changed. And this is something that uh, we discover that the Old Testament is very relevant because it speaks to people. Today, it's they, the Old Testament actually speaks to issues that people have today, the same kinds of issues of love, forgiveness, betrayal. 
All of those things, the fear of death, temptation, the struggle with doubt, all of those issues are universal. It's, it's kind of like the people in the Old Testament pretty much ate the same kinds of foods that we eat. We eat bread, and they, and, and they ate bread. You know, um, They drank water, and we drink water. These are characteristics that are universal to all human beings. Uh, here's another thing. Truth has not changed, and this is uh, something that makes the Old Testament very relevant to us today. Although what we try to do today is try to change the truth and reinvent the truth, truth really has not changed. You know, up is up, down is down, you know, and good is good and evil is evil. So truth has not changed. It still is evil to uh, murder, right? Or to spread rumors and gossip. Those are what we consider the same traits of human beings all throughout history. Truth has not changed. It will never change. So, you know, while you may read some books that have no authority and they may be outdated. The Bible never becomes outdated because the truths in the Bible are always the same. You know, they don't change. Uh, let's see here. It's, so Jesus also is revealed in the Old Testament. However, Jesus is the incarnate son of God who lived with God in eternity before he became um, Christ or Jesus, uh, the Messiah, to come to the earth. So before he came to the earth, Jesus himself was in eternity past with God. But all of the Old Testament scriptures reveal the person of Jesus Christ they conceal the person of Jesus Christ until he reveals himself. Let's, let's just say it like that. The Old Testament is, um, I guess you can say it like this. The Old Testament is Christ uh, concealed and, and the New Testament is Christ revealed. So the Old Testament, again, is Christ concealed and the New Testament is Christ revealed. And uh, so we see that Jesus illustrated this point on the road to Emmaus when the disciples uh, who had just seen him be crucified and had heard that he had been resurrected, they really did not realize that he really did get up from the grave. They just heard stories about it. And they were walking on the road of Emmaus discussing it because it was the news of the day. And Jesus appeared to them, but they never recognized who he was. The reason they never recognized who he was is because Jesus had not, had prevented them from knowing who he was. He didn't make himself known to them. But here's the telling truth about the Old Testament. As he walked up to talk to them and, you know, began a discussion with them, he began to explain using the Old Testament each time that the Old Testament spoke of him. You know, because again, they were very, very disappointed that Jesus had been crucified. They thought that they were hearing an old wives' tale, an old fable, when they heard that Jesus was resurrected. And so these people, these disciples on the road to Emmaus, uh, were not really believing the prophets and the prophecies of the Old Testament. So Jesus had to begin, starting from the book of Genesis, going through the entire Old Testament, revealing himself to them 
through the scriptures. Now, they still didn't recognize who Jesus was, but here's how Jesus approached it. He said to them, oh, foolish men, the slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. See, because the Old Testament speaks about Jesus as Christ concealed. Was it not necessary for Christ to suffer these things and to, and, um, to enter into his glory? Because the Old Testament recorded that Jesus would be crucified. But they forgot it. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Luke chapter 24, verse 25 through 27. So this is what opened their eyes. Now, the Bible says that the disciples were blind, blinded who, to who Jesus was, the resurrected Christ. But when Jesus did a survey of the Old Testament, when he explained to them, starting with Moses, the writings of Moses, which are the writings of Moses are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The first five books of the Bible are identified as the writings of Moses. So Jesus began to explain to them in the New Testament, starting with the writings of Moses. All and then all the rest of the prophets. Here are all the rest of the prophets here. And you can see them. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai. Zechariah and Malachi. And uh, what he did is he explained to them using each one of these scriptures that were spoken of him and pointed out to the blinded disciples. Now, they weren't physically blind, but they just didn't know who Jesus was. They, they didn't recognize him, who he was. And after explaining Concerning himself, the Bible says that then that's when their eyes were open. So, you know, then the Bible says that in the New Testament says that their eyes were open. These disciples eyes were open uh, and then they recognized who Jesus was after he explained, starting with the Old Testament what the scriptures were saying concerning himself. As, and the interesting thing about this is that um, they didn't know who he was until they did a survey of the Old Testament. So it, it could be that your understanding might be expanded by doing a survey of the Old Testament, you know, by, by coming to understand the uh, Old Testament and all the things that are in it. So not just some of the prophets they're saying here, but it was all the prophets. So all the prophets actually spoke of Jesus and it's Jesus concealed. It's very interesting, too, because, you know, you see Jesus in so many pictures. You see Jesus. Let's let's just take one example. I'll, I'll give you one off the top of my head. Uh, you see Cain and Abel, right? Cain brought his sacrifice and his sacrifice was not accepted, but Abel's was. Because Abel brought 
a lamb to be slain. And of course, Cain brought the fruit of the field. And that, that was a picture of man trying to do his own thing, his own works to be accepted by God. But the Abel was a picture of man depending on the slain lamb, Jesus Christ. So you can see that the lamb was slain in the Abel uh, story and Abel's offering was accepted. This is, uh, you know, recorded in the book of, of course, Genesis. But this shows a picture of who Jesus Christ is. He's the lamb which was slain for the sins of the world, right? So uh, as, we, as we go in deeper into the Old Testament study, there'll be more surprising um, revelations of Jesus Christ throughout the scriptures, Okay. All right. So the Old Testament was uh, written for us and whoever um, it, you got to understand that there are some people who believe that all they need to do is read the New Testament. But the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 15, verse four, for, um, let's see if I can get something to hold, hold this here, point to it, point to it here. And there it is. For whatever was written in early times, talking about the Old Testament, this is from the New Testament, was written for our instruction that through perseverance and the encouragement of Scripture, we might have hope. So the Old Testament, studying the Old Testament will give you hope. Now these things happen to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the age have come. So the Old Testament was also written for our instruction right here. And Romans says it was written so we might have hope. Okay? So, so when we study the Old Testament, we ought to recognize that there is a message that's being given on several levels. For example, interacting, God interacting with creation. And, you know, of course, they have uh, this symbol here. As creation, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, it's a little leaven mixed in with the leaven mixed in with this whole doctrine here. But anyway, we're still looking at it. At the same time, we ought to see another interaction taking place between Moses as the human author of the book and the original recipients of the writing, the Israelites in the wilderness. And so, again, now here's another thing that you need to know about the Old Testament is that the Old Testament was written specifically to Hebrews, about Hebrews, and was written, again, by the hands of Jewish writers, right? So m the majority of the writing is going to be um, in Hebrew and Aramaic. So this is another thing too. Uh, let's go here and we'll stop with the canon of the Old Testament and we'll, we will uh, maybe take up some more a little bit later on that. But uh, let's, let's look here. As we read the events of Genesis 1, Standing in sandals, Moses and the Israelites, who have just come out of Egypt, we shall uh, see certain things come to light that we might not otherwise notice. 
Okay, so let's find some things that will come to light in this uh, leading the children out of out of bondage. And we'll talk a little bit more about the bondage. God who creates light out of darkness is the same God who brought darkness over Egypt during the plague. So in the book of Genesis, um, in the very beginning of the book of Genesis, and let's go to Genesis chapter 1. That's what he's referring to. Okay, so in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, we will notice that the first thing that God did says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void and darkness. And this is the principal, uh, principal issue that we want to deal with, with God first. And darkness... Had you ever thought about what makes darkness such a dreadful thing? You know. So, and darkness was up on the face of the deep. So darkness is something that is just as dreadful as the earth was without, you know, form and void formless and void and dark. <clears throat> now, most of us think about light as very joyful, but darkness invokes in us a emotional response that when we hear about darkness, you know, we don't, we don't like it. As a matter of fact, your children have an innate fear of darkness when they are children. They don't want to be in the dark. They don't want to be left alone in the dark. That's why they spend most of their time in your bedroom when they're babies and when they're small children, they are afraid of the dark. So, you know, darkness is a very um, universal fear that we all have. So being, it was formless, void, and it was dark and uh, was up on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved up on the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. Now, there is something that appeals to everyone right here. Light. So that's very appealing. And the darkness, we don't like it. So you have God separating the light from the darkness. Now, what the author of the book here is presenting is that the parallels between Moses delivering the children of Israel or leading the deliverance of the children of Israel from bondage. And one of the principal things that God used against the Egyptians was darkness. He took away the light and he caused it to be darkness. He caused a plague of darkness that came over the entire land. And God creates light and darkness is the same God who brought darkness over Egypt during the plagues. Okay, because darkness is a universal fear. It's something that's in us that we do not like darkness. We are drawn to the light. Here's another one. God, who separated the waters from the waters on the second day of creation, is the same God who separated the waters of the Red Sea to deliver the Israelites from Pharaoh. Oh, is that interesting? Well, what is that? Where is that found? On the second day of creation, God, after separating darkness from light, 
God called the light day and the darkness he called night. He did that on the first day. And then even in the morning where the second day said the first day. And then and God said, let the firmament be in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. So here we have God who separated the waters from the waters on the second day of creation is the same God who separates the waters of the Red Sea to deliver the Israelites from Pharaoh. Isn't that interesting? And so God created a, a wall that separated the waters from the waters, which people believe that. People believe that. Generally, we know it's true because we can go to the Red Sea, and from what I understand, you can take a um, submarine and send it down there, and there are all these chariot wheels that are under the sea, and no one can explain where the chariot wheels came from. That same God who separated the waters from the waters in that situation at the Red Sea also separated the waters which were over the earth that was without form and void. It was just a void. And so the entire universe, we can, we can believe, was filled with water. And so God came and made in between the waters an expanse or a division and he separated the waters from the waters in the midst of the waters. And he said, let it divide the waters from the waters. What do you know? There wasn't any spinning earth or any ball or globe. It was just water. And he separated the waters from the waters. And then God made a permanent place here. And God made a permanent firmament, firmament, a firm, hard glass bubble between the waters that divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament and it was so. Now, I want you to imagine this. God is describing or Moses is describing a universe that does not have space. He's describing a universe that's made up of total water. That's what he's describing. And this universe that's made of total water, God came and separated the waters from the waters. Well, where else do we see that? Well, he did it when he caused the children of Israel to walk across the Red Sea. And every, every child has heard this story. On dry land, because he pushed the waters back and he separated the waters from the waters. So now we see that the universe was made of water and God put a separation, a firmament in between that and he caused a space in between the waters like a breathing place, a place where people can breathe because guys, if God hadn't have done that, we'd all be on the water right now. We'd be like a bunch of fish, like Aquaman. But what God actually separated the waters from the waters. Then another thing, seven, and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. As it says in Psalms 148, that there is water above the firmament. Praise ye the Lord. Ye waters above the firmament. And if you don't believe me, go and read the Bible. 
It's right in there. It's not a canopy, guys. It's water up there. And I often say, that's why the sky is blue. And God called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day. Still no earth. Still no earth. Earth hadn't, not yet. It was, it was second day of creation. It was water. First day of creation, it was separation of light from dark. Uh, second day of creation, it was separated, separation of water from water. Okay, and then the third day, he says, and God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. There it is. And God called the dry land. Get this, guys. This is, this is, this is going to be the zinger, the humzinger, the humdinger. Crawl the dry land, earth. So the dry land is earth, not the water. What did God call the waters? He called the waters seas. And God saw that it was good. It's amazing. What do you think about that? Okay, so uh, let's go to the next thing. It says, while back in Egypt, let me see, what do we do with that? Oh, oh here it is. Uh, the next one. God, who called the sun and the moon and the stars, is the same creator of those things which they worship back in Egypt. So, yeah, they did worship the sun, moon, and the stars. Sun, moon, and stars were created on the fourth day of creation. And so that's what happened. And then while back in Egypt, the various gods were worshipped in the form of all sorts of beasts and birds and creeping things as God created and first brought them into being. Remember, God created all of the creeping things of the earth. And it's only Pharaoh, it's, it's not only Pharaoh of Egypt, but all men who were made in the image of God, and this extends to both male and female. So while the Israelites were in the wilderness disheartened and discouraged, they think back to the gardens of Egypt and the food gardens, and the same God who made Eden had promised them a land that flows with milk and honey. Finally, when we have seen the message of the original narrative and then have through the eyes of the original author and recipients, we will be ready also to see the message here for us. Okay, so there's a message uh, in the Old Testament. And that's pretty much uh, what we're going to discuss right today. I'll be back. I'll talk some more about the uh, Old Testament, why it's important to study it. But you do see that, uh, again, it has relevance for us and is very necessary uh, that uh, we go over the Old Testament in order to know the mind of God and get to know who God is throughout time and eternity. So, okay, that's it, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I don't know if there's any questions uh, you guys might have. If you have some questions, uh, don't, don't worry. Don't, uh, don't be intimidated because I will be doing this uh, continually uh, because we are doing a survey of the Old Testament. And maybe we'll pick up some people. You can go to coffeewithjesuschurch.org. Coffee with Jesus Church. Is, yeah, it's a strange name, isn't it? Coffeewithjesuschurch.org.org. And um, 
sign in over there if you like what you hear. Or if you're listening to this later on and you like what you hear. Uh, and you'd like to become part of what we're doing. Uh, either way, God bless, and I'll be uh, talking to you guys later.